Good evening. Thanks for joining us. With the sheer volume of news now turning every week into what seems like a year, this week felt like two years. And today was quite something all by itself. Plenty of news broke today. It all seemed to revolve around the Russia probe. There was news on the president's opposition to it, news on his attorney general's recusal from it, on White House efforts to keep that attorney general in charge, on presidential rage reportedly when that effort failed, and news breaking just now that others beyond White House counsel Don McGahn were doing the arm twisting. Also today, what some see as fair game and others call a smokescreen, two Republican senators asking the FBI to investigate the author of the now famous dossier and something the president once slammed his attorney general for not pursuing, investigating the Clinton Foundation. We learn today that is happening. Overhanging all of it, of course, reaction to Michael Wolff's tell-all book and the central figure in it, the fired chief strategist President Trump now calls sloppy Steve Bannon, Wolf's defense of his reporting, and the remark he attributes to Bannon about the president's fitness for office. All of those threads intertwine tonight, adding new facts, new context, and much more color to the entire Russia saga and our picture of a president and a presidency under pressure, to say the least. We'll talk about all of that tonight. We have the reporting from CNN and others, including the New York Times, on the roots of the president's ire at Jeff Sessions, which came to a head, as you may recall, late last July. I am disappointed in the attorney general. Uh, He should not have recused himself almost immediately after he took office. And if he was going to recuse himself, he should have told me prior to taking office. And I would have quite simply picked somebody else. Uh, So I think that's a bad thing, not for the president, but for the presidency. I think it's unfair to the presidency. And uh, that's the way I feel. Well, the same day, the president tweeted, Attorney General Jeff Sessions has taken a very weak position on Hillary Clinton crimes. Where are emails and DNC server and intel leakers? A president publicly humiliating his attorney general. We reported on it then on the pressure on him to resign. But today's reporting, as well as scenes in the Wolf book, add new dimensions, not just to what we know, but also to our indications of what special counsel Mueller knows and might be folding into his probe. For that, as well as the larger investigation, I want to bring in CNN Chief National Security Correspondent Jim Shudo. So where does the reporting stand on what President Trump wanted from Jeff Sessions? Well, this is what we know. A source tells CNN that McGahn, the White House counsel, did in fact reach out to Jeff Sessions uh, to urge him to not recuse himself from that investigation, despite the fact that Sessions had issues that could be a potential conflict of interest, including the fact that he had met with Russian officials and had not disclosed those meetings. Uh, A White House, or I should say another official telling my colleague Jim Acosta that others were involved in that effort as well to urge Sessions not to recuse himself. The New York Times adds... Uh, that this was done under the direction of the president, that the president asked his lawyer and other staffers to reach out to, uh, to Sessions not to recuse himself, and that Mueller, Robert Mueller, the special counsel, is aware of this, and that this is part of his obstruction of justice investigation. CNN has previous, previously reported that Mueller is looking into the possibility, at least, of obstruction of justice, and that is based uh, on another issue, of course, that we've talked about many times, which is the firing of the FBI director, James Comey, Anderson, you know, the bar is very high for obstruction of justice. You need to prove uh, corrupt intentions as well. But we do know that this is something that the special counsel is looking into. And what we've learned in the last 24 hours is at least another thread in that possible case. It, it does seem, and everyone we talked to last night about the story about Don McGahn reaching out said, well, look, if, if any White House is going to reach out to the Justice Department, it should be done through the general counsel. The, the, the White House uh, attorney, the idea that others high-level officials were also pressured to reach out to Sessions. That seems kind of surprising. Well, it speaks to, listen, if there's a channel, uh, that may be the channel. But I spoke last night, I spoke to uh, a lawyer who was a very senior legal position in a previous administration. I want to identify the administration. But he said that under that administration, there, there were very clear firewalls uh, between issues like this, that, that, that White House lawyers could explicitly not reach out, that the president could not explicitly reach out to the Justice Department during active investigations, and that that was a rule. This is, I mean, w- when you look at this case, this is clearly beyond uh, just a blurring of the lines. It was an active effort, at least according to the New York Times reporting, an active effort directed by the president himself uh, to try to interrupt uh, the attorney general's recusal from something where you had what appeared to be clear conflicts of interest. And, yeah. and listen, it's interesting enough for Robert Mueller to be looking into it. Whether it leads him to an obstruction of justice uh, case, we don't know that yet. All right. Jim Shudo. Jim, thanks very much. As Jim just mentioned, there's yet another dimension to the effort to keep Sessions involved in the Russia probe, which we're just now learning. Jim Acosta joins us now with the story he broke. Jim, what have you learned? 
Uh, that's right, Anderson. As Jim Shooter was just talking about uh, in the last uh, couple of minutes, uh, there were more officials uh, involved in this pressure campaign to urge Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, to recuse himself or to not recuse himself in the Russia investigation. Uh, I talked to a source familiar with these conversations uh, just a short while ago. Uh, that uh, senior administration official uh, told me, uh, quote, I think it is fair to call it pressure. Uh, that is a quote from this official describing these conversations that went on uh, between top White House officials and uh, staff members uh, in the attorney general's office, uh, including the attorney general, Jeff Sessions. Uh, and I should also point out, uh, according to uh, the senior administration official, uh, this person described what was going on and the conversations regarding uh, Jeff Sessions' decision to recuse himself or not recuse himself as being, quote, chaos uh, and so it sounds like, Anderson, when this uh, was going on, when this conversation was happening between the White House and the attorney general's office, uh, there was a, a very vigorous debate as to what the attorney general should do. And it sounds like, according to the senior administration official I talked to earlier this evening, that it was not just the White House counsel at the urging of the president who was leaning on the attorney general to not do this, but also top White House officials here as well. Has the, has the White House responded to this new reporting? Uh, they have not responded, and we are in the process of contacting some of these top uh, officials, former top officials, uh, who were involved in those conversations, and we'll get back to you if, if that information develops. The, the president's meeting at Camp David this weekend with members of Congress, cabinet secretaries. One person who's not going to be joining him is Jeff Sessions. Do we know why? Well, we don't, we don't exactly know why. I, I did talk to a senior administration official earlier this evening about this who said, listen, uh, the attorney general will be involved in other events with the president uh, in, the, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, the attorney general is not on this trip, and he was not invited on this trip. Uh, but this official said this should not be looked at as a snub. And the White House said earlier this evening, despite the fact that you have uh, various cabinet officials, you have top uh, congressional officials, uh, and uh, as well as uh, top members of the president's staff, uh, not, not to mention the vice president, despite the fact that they're all up there, uh, that this should not be read as any kind of uh, snub or message to Jeff Sessions. Uh, the, the White House said earlier this evening that the White House stands firmly behind Jeff Sessions. Of course, that statement coming from the White House did not say the president stands firmly behind Jeff Sessions. Uh, they're only saying the White House does at this point. Anderson. All right. Jim Acosta, appreciate that. Thanks. Whether it's the, sure. the president asking Don McGahn and others to try and keep Jeff Sessions on board or the reported effort to gather dirt on James Comey, or the depiction of Michael Wolff's book or the president laying down talking points on the Trump Tower meeting that he must have known were not true. It's all focusing attention on a single question. Does it add up to obstruction of justice or merely a president exercising his legitimate authority as chief executive? Joining us now is Richard Blumenthal, Democratic member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator Blumenthal, we now know it wasn't just Don McGahn pressuring Jeff Sessions not to recuse himself, the two other high-ranking White House officials. Do you see this as obstruction of justice? This excellent reporting certainly indicates a key element of an obstruction of justice case, which is corrupt intent. And what is building here, it may not have reached the threshold of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, is clearly an effort to shut down the investigation, to interfere with it by, in effect, telling Jeff Sessions he had to maintain control over it and stymie it if possible. And the standard here has to be a high one for any kind of obstruction case. But clearly, when you're dealing with senior White House officials and the president of the United States, the bar is especially high. But here's one point for sure. Jeff Sessions ought to explain this kind of contact from the White House. The White House staff ought to be called before the grand jury. And I would predict there'll be convictions and indictments early in the new year. Convictions and indictments of people currently in the White House staff? Currently in the White House staff or past White House staff, because the momentum of this investigation is clearly building. And what is striking here is the fact that the Mueller investigation is moving methodically and meticulously. He is proceeding with great care and caution keeping out of the public eye. What we know about it comes from this extraordinary reporting, which establishes this explosive facts about obstruction of justice. You know, we were talking to John Dean last night on this program, obviously, who was a White House counsel under the Nixon administration and did testify. He was pointing out that Don McGahn's um, obligation is to the office of the presidency, not to this individual president, not to President Donald Trump, but to the office of the presidency as such. I mean, he was at the center of a lot of these conversations. 
if he was privy to or believes there was any kind of illegality or anything inappropriate, do you believe it's his obligation to come forward with that? He has an obligation as an attorney as well as the White House counsel, whose client is the presidency, not personally Donald Trump, to cooperate with any legitimate law enforcement investigation. So he has some obligations here. But what's striking also is the president's fundamental misunderstanding of the role of attorney general. He wants someone to protect him, a Roy Cohn, a fixer, a henchman. And that is certainly far from what the attorney general of the United States should be. And I'll be very blunt, Anderson. I was one of the first members of the Judiciary Committee to oppose Jeff Sessions as attorney general. I voted against him and I've differed with him repeatedly on policies. He did the right thing by recusing himself. There's no question about it. And for Don McGahn to try to talk him out of it, I think was really a mistake. It's also stunning the the example that for the president to use of a kind of attorney general he wants being Roy Cohn, who I, if memory serves me, was disbarred ultimately toward the end of his career. He was disbarred for a very good reason. He represented certain mob figures. He was Donald Trump's personal lawyer as well as his fixer. That's the identification given to him in the New York Times story. And he also was at Senator McCarthy's side at some of the lowest points in the United States Senate. When Sessions did recuse himself, the president, according to The Times, erupted in anger, saying he needed an attorney general who protected him like he believed Bobby Kennedy did for JFK or as he believed Eric Holder did for Obama. I mean, that is not how it's supposed to work. An attorney general is there not to protect the president. Far from protecting the president, he is supposed to protect the people of the United States. He is the people's lawyer. They are his client. And this point is really fundamental to the Department of Justice and so important for Rod Rosenstein to carry out as well in protecting the special counsel from any kind of political interference, any kind of fear or favor. And it again, goes to one of the points I've been making that we need as Congress to protect that special counsel through legislation that would stop his firing. There should be legislation. I hope it will be bipartisan. The bills I've introduced, along with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, are bipartisan to make sure that the president cannot fire the special counsel or fire Rob Rosenstein on the way to firing the special counsel. Uh, I want to turn to former FBI Director Comey. According to the Times, an aide to Sessions approached a Hill staffer looking for dirt on Comey because the attorney general wanted one negative article a day about the FBI director. DOJ spokeswoman denied that this happened. But if it's true, is that appropriate? I mean, do you believe if that's true, do you believe Sessions should resign? Inappropriate and hard to believe that the attorney general of the United States would seek dirt on his own FBI director. It so contravenes the ethic of the Department of Justice that it seems unbelievable. But my view is that Jeff Sessions should stay in office because the calls for his resignation are part of an effort to discredit all law enforcement and to distract from the investigation as well as possibly subvert the special counsel investigation. It would be a step toward firing the special counsel. And that's why I think that the attorney general should remain in office. The calls for him to resign come mainly from the Trump sycophants and henchmen who want the investigation to stop. Hmm. Senator Blumenthal, appreciate your time. Thank you. Coming Thank you. Up, up next, our investigative and legal experts weigh in on what you just heard. Carl Bernstein, John Dean, and Richard Benvenista. Later, more reaction to Michael Wolff's book. New reporting on Steve Bannon's reaction and Wolff's defense of his own reporting. That and more when we continue. The breaking news that two other high-ranking officials were also involved in the attempt to keep Attorney General Sessions from recusing himself on Russia adds yet another dimension to the question of obstruction of justice. Here's the Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal, who serves on the Judiciary Committee, said about it just moments ago. This excellent reporting certainly indicates a key element of an obstruction of justice case, which is corrupt intent. And what is building here, it may not have reached the threshold of proof beyond a reasonable doubt is 
clearly an effort to shut down the investigation, to interfere with it by, in effect, telling Jeff Sessions he had to main control over it and stymie it if possible. So I want to continue uh, this issue. Former Watergate uh, prosecutor Richard Benveniste joins us. Former Watergate participant, star witness and defendant, Richard Nixon's White House counsel, John Dean. Also with us, CNN political analyst Carl Bernstein, who some might remember from that Washington local newspaper back in the 70s. Carl, um, I mean, obviously, look, some are the president allies are going to say Richard Blumenthal is obviously a, a Democrat. He's going to say what he's going to say. Do you think this is a possible obstruction of justice case moving closer to the president himself. Yes, it's a possible obstruction case. There's a pattern of apparent obstruction, but that's different than a cold case. And what's extraordinary is how much we do not know Mm. about the Mueller investigation. And that makes the attempts by Donald Trump and those around him to shut down the Mueller investigation all the more vile, inappropriate, and in itself perhaps an obstruction. And he's being joined in this and enabled in this by senior Republicans in Congress. And we, and we have to ask at this point, are not these senior people in the Republican Party interested in the truth about what has happened here? Are they really that interested in putting partisan and ideological interest above the truth and above what's good for the country? And we're rapidly approaching that as they double down. Even as the same people, some of the same ones that we're seeing quoted trying to go after this investigation are those who have told me and other reporters in private they doubt the president's stability. Hmm. The same people. So why They've actually are, said that to you. Oh, yes. And you and I have discussed this on the air before. How many intel people, senior military leaders, and Republicans in Congress going back three months ago, four months ago, you can look the clips up, you and I discussing it, have been saying in private they doubt the president and stability. Hmm. Uh, John, I mean, Michael Wolff quotes Steve Bannon as saying of the president, quote, he wants an unrecused attorney general. I told him if Jeff Sessions goes, Rod Rosenstein goes, uh, Rachel Brand, the associate attorney general, next in line after Rosenstein goes, we'll be digging down into Obama career guys. An Obama guy will be acting attorney general. I mean, does it surprise you that it was Steve Bannon, of all people, reportedly trying to talk the president out of a Nixon style Saturday night massacre? Uh, well, it, it, it doesn't because I think he knows his history, uh, which maybe many of the others in the White House don't. Uh, he certainly understands that. So I think that was good advice. In fact, somebody in the counsel's office didn't tell him all the facts with the hope that he wouldn't fire the attorney general. Uh, so there are there are lots of uh, problems here. I think one of the things one of the points Carl made, I'd like to reinforce, and that is how little we know. Because I know how much we knew inside the White House when Carl was reporting, and it looked like they had the story, but they were months behind Mm. uh, what was actually happening. And you think that's the case today? I mean, for all the reporting that's gone on, you think uh, possibly we're all months behind where Robert Mueller is? I do think that, yes. Wow. Richard, how concerned should President Trump be about what Don McCann knows and whom he has or will talk to? Well, I think uh, the president uh, has to be concerned that uh, his counsel is now going to be caught up in the investigation. Sending his counsel over uh, to uh, the Department of Justice to try to countermand a decision uh, which was recommended by uh, the, uh, as far as we know, uh, without dissent, Uh, All of the professionals at the senior levels of the Justice Department who looked at the facts and said to the attorney general, look, you have got to recuse yourself from supervising an investigation in which you are a witness and possibly more seriously have involved yourself in uh, giving testimony that is inaccurate uh, about your uh, meetings with the Russian ambassador. And so uh, doing this certainly gives the impression that uh, the president was very concerned with someone independent looking at the facts associated with the Russian interference with our election and related matters. Carl, I mean, the key point that I think is so important that Jeff Tubin made last night is that even if there was nothing illegal about anything that the Trump campaign did or had any contacts with Russia... The attempt to an, an attempt to obstruct justice, even if it's an unsuccessful attempt to obstruct justice, that in itself, court after court after court has said that is illegal. Of course. And, you know, in Watergate, there was this trope 
that uh, the cover-up is worse than the crime, which wasn't true. The crimes in Watergate were incredible, abusive, beyond astonishing. Yet now what is possible is that here the cover-up could be worse than the crime. There is no question that from the beginning Donald Trump has attempted to cover up all things Russian, tried to demean, undermine, and obstruct this investigation. At what point that crosses the line into criminality and a charge of obstruction of justice, that's where we don't know Mm. enough. But certainly the pattern that we are seeing is so suggestive at no of obstruction of justice, at no point since this president has taken office, has he said, let's do the right thing with this investigation? John Dean, I mean, was it ever clear if President Nixon personally greenlit the Watergate burglary? Because, I mean, that's not really what forced him from office. It was the, the, the impending articles of impeachment, which included obstruction, right? No, that, it, it is very true he did not green light the Watergate break in. He had no knowledge of it. In fact, to my knowledge, nobody in the White House knew they were going to break in the Watergate. What the cover-up was being motivated by in the Nixon era was the fact that, in fact, Nixon didn't know of this fully initially, uh, was the fact that uh, those who'd broken in the Watergate had earlier, while working at the White House, broken into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office under the pretext of national security uh, to try to see what Ellsberg's uh, medical records had to try to discredit him. It was a as John Mitchell, the head of the re-election committee and former attorney generals, thought that crime was worse than the bungled burglary that uh, he'd approved at the Watergate. Yeah. There was a whole series of abuse of criminal abuse of power, including yes. the misuse of the IRS, unprecedented crimes by a president of the United States mm-hmm. seeking to undermine the rule of law, going back to his first days in office, uh, not simply about intelligence gathering and this vast campaign of political espionage and sabotage. We've we got to uh, take a quick break because I want to keep the panel because I want to get everybody's take on something else that happened today. And Carl referenced just a second ago, Christopher Steele, the author of the Trump dossier could face a criminal investigation if two Republican senators get their request approved by the Department of Justice. What that is all about when we continue. Tonight, there's a new twist in the Russia investigation to Republican senators. Chuck Grassley, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee and fellow committee member, Senator Lindsey Graham, want Trump dossier writer Christopher Steele to face a criminal investigation. They spelled out their concerns in a letter to the Department of Justice. Our senior congressional correspondent, Mano Raju, has details. So, Mano, what's the latest? Well, the two senior Republicans, Anderson, are calling for the Justice Department to investigate whether or not Christopher Steele lied to the FBI about his contacts with the news media about this dossier that, of course, that he compiled, looking at these allegations of Trump-Russia connections, as well as Trump associates meeting with Russians during the campaign season. Now, uh, what Senator Chuck Grassley, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and Senator Lindsey Graham, who's also a senior member of that same committee, are saying is that, uh, that there are some inconsistencies statements that Mr. Steele made to the FBI, and they want the Justice Department to look into whether or not there was any criminal wrongdoing by potentially lying to them. Now, this is so serious, according to Lindsey Graham, that he believes that there should be another special counsel named to investigate this matter fully. Now, this is what Lindsey Graham says. He says, after reviewing how Mr. Steele conducted himself in distributing information contained in the dossier and how many stop signs the DOJ ignored in its use of the dossier... I believe that a special counsel needs to review this matter. The rule of law depends on the government and all who work on its behalf playing by the rules themselves. Now, Anderson, uh, it's important to note that the, the dossier was not the basis of the, uh, the investigation that the FBI launched into Trump-Russia connections. They had their own investigation ongoing. They did meet with Mr. Steele and they uh, helped in the, some of the things that he found uh, what they used as part of their investigation, but it was not the basis of their own investigation. Uh, but Anderson, no word tonight on whether the Justice Department will move forward on its own investigation to Mr. Steele, who Republicans for a long time have been going after as part of their own investigations, believe that his uh, dossier was filled with uh, what they believe are unsubstantiated charges. Well, I mean, just to be clear, they're not alleging that anything in the dossier itself is, is false. Is that right? 
That is correct. In fact, they make very clear in their letter that uh, the referral does not even uh, talk about the veracity of the claims uh, in the dossier itself. It's strictly talking about whether or not he lied about his contacts with the news media uh, uh, about the dossier itself. Now, Anderson, uh, Christopher Steele, it's important to remember, was hired by uh, the, the firm Fusion GPS, an opposition research firm, which was first uh, paid for by uh, Republicans during the primary season and it was later paid for by Democrats, including the Hillary Clinton campaign during the campaign season. And Fusion GPS wrote an op-ed for the New York Times earlier this week uh, saying that they did not tell Mr. Steele who was funding his research, but they just wanted him to look into these business contacts. Uh, and they, that's how, they deter- how he determined that there was potential wrongdoing w- uh, during the campaign season. And that's why he briefed the FBI later. And Anderson, tonight, Democrats are saying this is all a distraction. And they, did not, they were not even consulted about this referral to the Justice Department, Anderson. All right, Manoraj Yamano, thanks. Thanks. Back now with our panel. Carl, I mean, do you think this is a distraction? Is this an attempt for, by Republicans to run interference for the president? Yes. It's, uh, it's not just a distraction or a red herring. It's a glowing red herring in the Washington swamp. Uh, the, the idea, this is about supposedly steel the author of what's called the dossier, which is actually a series of individual reports, talking to reporters. Uh, And whatever he may or may not have said to the FBI about talking to reporters. It is such a sideshow. It is another attempt to discredit the Mueller investigation. And why on earth we cannot allow, and why the members of the Congress of the United States cannot allow this investigation to continue so that we can find out what has happened here. There's plenty of time when Mueller is finished to look at all these sideshows. That's the time to do it. But let's get on with this investigation. Let's find out what this president did, did not do. He may be exonerated by Mueller. Give him a chance to be exonerated. But let this investigation proceed. It's lawful. It's methodical. We have no evidence whatsoever that Bob Mueller is anything but a straight-up public servant. Uh, And let's cut the nonsense already, because it's a real failure of our democratic institutions if this if this investigation is stymied any further. Richard, I mean, A, do you believe that the Grass and Graham are attempting to run interference, just as I asked Carl? And B, was there a similar political pushback during Watergate? It looks like um, they're uh, going right for the capillary here. Uh, I'm, af- I'm afraid I have to agree with Carl that the, this is certainly not central to anything. Uh, it is uh, uh, a, a sop uh, to the Trump camp. I'm very disappointed in Senator Graham. Um, I testified before his subcommittee. Senator Graham um, was clear in his assurance to me personally and uh, on the record that the uh, Judiciary Committee was uh, committed to protecting uh, the Mueller investigation. And uh, uh, I'm sorry to see that uh, they're engaging in this kind of partisan uh, diversion. It's unfortunate. John Dean, I mean, we talked about this briefly a little bit last night with you. The president reportedly calling, uh, called Comey a rat, comparing him to you. Um, I, I want to just read you another brief portion of the Michael Wolff book, get your reaction. Wolf describes the president as a, quote, John Dean freak who, quote, went bananas whenever you were on TV comparing this situation to Watergate and their appearances prompt the president to do a, quote, talk back monologue to the screen about loyalty. So if the president is watching you right now, I guess what is your message to him? <laughs> Well, I, I, my message tonight would be that this is another red herring, this sideshow that the Senate is putting on for him. Uh, and I'm not sure that there is any criminal case there. Uh, as Richard would know uh, th- and just mentioned, uh, the relevancy of the question of whether he talked to the media versus whether he's talking to the FBI about his sources and things like that is so out of the main of the investigation uh, that it's irrelevant. And I can't believe a prosecutor would ever pursue this as some sort of false statement of the FBI. It looks uh, like the, the president... It looks like the president is channeling his inner uh, Sonny Corleone um, and being upset that his attorney general is not the kind of wartime consigliere that he thinks uh, Barack Obama and Jack Kennedy had. And he needs a Sicilian like Roy Cohn 
one of the most reviled human beings of his generation, uh, to be his uh, 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 consigliere here, his attorney general, and a complete misreading of what the function of the attorney general and, and of the ju- United States And just for those who aren't as familiar with The Godfather, Sonny was really the worst of the sons in terms of his judgment. He was the hothead. Um, uh, he was, yeah, didn't end and well. The, and the accidental leader of the family uh, when the Don uh, was laid up with gunshot wounds. Right. Let me yes. add one thing about this whole question of leaks and the idea that, again, this sideshow is uh, so uppermost in the minds of some members of the U.S. Senate. Uh, I'm not going to name names here, uh, but I would venture to say that most members of the U.S. Senate routinely, quote, leak information to reporters uh, almost on a daily basis, that often it involves national security information, which perhaps they oughtn't to be leaking, uh, and they ought to know better than to go down this road uh, because they themselves would be subject to the same kind of investigation, and Correct. they wouldn't hold up very well under it. Carl Bernstein, John Dean, uh, Richard Benveniste, a great discussion. Thank you. We've just gotten reaction from Sean Spicer, who we named at the top of the program as one of two additional high-ranking officials involved in trying unsuccessfully to keep Attorney General Sessions from recusing himself from the Russia probe. Here's what Spicer told us just moments ago. Quote, for eight months, the narrative was that I was out of the loop, and now I'm part of it. I don't think so. Sort of a non-answer answer, actually. Coming up, the Fire and Fury author speaks out what Michael Wolff has to say about the president's claim that he never spoke to him for that book and that it's full of lies. Sloppy Steve apparently being the president's new nickname for Steve Bannon. Here's some of what Michael Wolff had to say on the Today Show. I, I, absol- I absolutely spoke to the president, whether he realized it was an interview or not. Um, I, I don't know, but it certainly was not off the record. I have recordings. I have notes. Um, I am certainly in absolutely in every way comfortable with everything I've reported in this book. My, my credibility is being cres- questioned by a man who has less credibility than perhaps anyone who has ever walked on earth at this point. I've written many books. I've written millions upon millions of words. I don't think there has ever been one correction. So you stand by everything in the book, nothing made up. Absolutely everything in the book. Well, this is definitely a moment for Michael Wolf, but it's not his first repertorial rodeo. Randy Kay tonight has more on that. This is the most extraordinary story of our time. Once a copy boy for the New York Times, Michael Wolff is now media's favorite bad boy. At 64, Wolf is immersed in a world of media and money, power and politics. He's been always been very upfront about the fact that that's who he wanted to be. He doesn't have an interest in being kind of a shoe leather reporter. He uses media reporting, or in this case, political uh, reporting, as a way to hang out with the elite that he really is fascinated by. Michelle Cottle, a contributing editor for The Atlantic, who interviewed Wolf years ago, describes him as part gossip columnist and part psychotherapist, whose writing is so distinctive, it's more like art. It is his very peculiar writing style where he'll set the scene so he doesn't say someone said and then a quote. He will say this is what they would have said or should have said in these circumstances. So it's it's a little bit of art that he's sticking in there that makes it not quite a hard quote. In fact, Wolf has been accused of inaccuracies in his reporting over the years and his style is anything but conventional. Cottle says that Wolf doesn't work the phones like most reporters. He doesn't go on the record and off the record either. In fact, she says he frowns on conventional reporting, instead choosing simply to observe and take in the atmosphere. Wolf has had a long and polarizing career. In the 1990s, he started an Internet company. Since then, he's written for Vanity Fair, New York Magazine and The Guardian. Most recently, he worked as a columnist and media critic for The Hollywood Reporter, and USA Today. There's a Michael Wolf here to see you. Read Michael Wolf and thank your lucky stars he's not writing about you. USA Today. This is off the record. Wolf once wrote a scathing book about billionaire media mogul Rupert Murdoch, calling him the whoremaster of the tabloid business. Niceties are not his specialty.
he will go where other reporters generally won't. And that earned him quite a reputation. And it's that buzzy, catty way of reporting and writing that readers gobble up. He would make really cutting personal observations about the rich and famous and their wives and their children. He once sent his child as a spy to Steve Ratner's house um, when he was writing about Ratner. And people were appalled. But he knows that readers love that stuff. And controversy is his friend. And that means... He's in friendly confines now. Randy Kay, CNN, New York. With me now, CNN political analyst and New York Times White House correspondent Maggie Haberman. And back with us, CNN chief national security correspondent Jim Shudo. <coughs> Excuse me, Maggie, you've read the book. At this point, based on what your knowledge of the White House, your reporting, mm-hmm. can, do you have a sense of how much of the book is accurate? I mean, can you put a figure on it? I, I, I couldn't I couldn't wait it to, to right. scale. Um, it was funny, though, listening to the Michelle Cottle interview and thinking about uh, who else we can think of um, who uh, likes to issue what's described as conventions and make personally cutting remarks. It sounds a lot like the person who this book is about. Mm. Um, there is a similarity there. Um, there, are, there are absolutely uh, things, uh, the, the, the majority of certainly uh, notional reporting in this book is accurate. Um, there are several. When you say notional uh, reporting, you I mean, mean the idea that um, the people working for him, um, who uh, either have known him for a long time or who haven't, um, have some degree of being perplexed by him. Mm-hmm. Um, that there is definitely a family dynamic that has um, vexed White House aides for a very long time. We have all written about that for mm. a very long time as well. Um, there is, uh, uh, you know, a, a degree to which his style is uh, peculiar. Uh, that he is certainly not, not interested in uh, learning outside of his comfort zone. My colleague Glenn Thrush and Peter Baker and I wrote about this a couple weeks ago. Um, a lot of it is true. There are also a, lo- a lot, and not, I'm not talking about like minor details. There are a lot of details that are just simply not accurate. Um, they're, they're getting a bit of a ride on Twitter tonight. Um, and then there are things that are that um, people say they either didn't say or that, you know, we're sort of in spirit but not quite right. Um, And then there are things that are simply uh, fantastical based on what I know, such as the idea that Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump had a a deal to, you know, one of them run for president first, whoever had an opening. Um, And it's not even really clear how he would have that kind of insight or that kind of an access. And the book is designed to paint a, a, a portrayal of proximity. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was indeed at the White House. I saw him at the White House uh, a couple of times, uh, waiting in the West Wing lobby when I was there. So, I mean, he, he was there. Um, under under what circumstances, under what agreements people thought they were agreeing to, who knows. But, you know, y- y- the problem for the White House is they, they often try to have things both ways and say, you know, not be fully in with someone on cooperating um, on a, either a book or a long magazine piece, not be fully out so they can then later disown it. The rules just aren't the same when you're the president. It doesn't work that way. Uh, Jim, I mean, you've done extensive reporting about this Russian investigation. The things in the book regarding the meeting in Trump Tower, the crafting of the statement about that meeting, how much is in line with, with your reporting? Well, the, myself and my colleagues reporting, the, the essential fact of, or the account rather, of the president drafting a statement which was misleading to false, frankly, about what took place in that Trump Tower meeting is, is not in dispute. It's certainly in line with our reporting, Maggie, Maggie's reporting, and others. Well, uh, and, I'll well, asterisk that in a second. Well, I won't, I won't, I mean, I'm not going to say that Wolf's yeah. exact words. I'm saying the essential fact at, at the center of that, that the president took part in drafting a uh, mm-hmm. drafting an account of the Trump Tower meeting that within 24 yes. hours was found not to be true, yes. right? When, when emails reported by the New York Times showed that, in fact, yep. uh, the lawyers involved offered uh, information, and we have since spoken to the people involved in that meeting and others, uh, where they were offering, in fact, dirt on Hillary Clinton. You know, the, that... That is very consistent with, yep. with the book. Our own reporting is very consistent with the book. And, and that is, you know, that's, that's a subject of Robert Mueller's investigation. Right. We know that as well, because this is the president uh, giving a misleading account, uh, really a false account, uh, of what took place in, in that meeting. It, the, the legal questions that then arise from that, these are not resolved. Did he instruct subordinates to, in effect, uh, lie, give false statements. That, that's a question for Robert Mueller right now. But we do, do know that that is something that Robert Mueller is looking in, right. into. Uh, 
as part of a broader look into the possibility of obstruction of justice. Yeah, Maggie, you want to say? Well, he was looking into it before this book. I mean, I guess that's the only thing that I would no say. Question. Is this was Absolutely. a meeting that the New York Times first reported on in the summer of 2017. Um, we reported uh, first that the president uh, was involved in, in, in I, 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 I balk at the word drafting only because that's not really how the president does these things. He kind of barks things out and conceptual and whatever. Um, but, um, but he certainly was uh, involved. And this was all done uh, on Air Force One, and we reported that as well. So the reporting in the book matches our reporting to the extent that it is, <laughs> it is our reporting, much of it initially. Um, and there are some details that are fleshed out. He, what, what Wolf is able to do with a book that we, we don't have the ability to do with daily reporting is he can paint a 300-page narrative right. that, that is a much larger picture that I think is easier for people to seize on when they are trying to get a 360 view of this presidency. Right, Marie's almost like a novel at times in, in, that, in that sense. Maggie, thanks very much. Jim is well. Coming up, why federal authorities are investigating the Clinton Foundation. This is according to a U.S. official briefed on the matter. What we know next. Federal authorities are actively investigating the Clinton Foundation, looking to whether donors were promised special access to Hillary Clinton while she was Secretary of State. A U.S. official confirms the investigation to CNN. Laura Jarrett joins us now with more on that. So what have you learned about this? Well, Anderson, this is a pretty serious legal development. That U.S. official tells me that the FBI and federal prosecutors down in Little Rock, Arkansas, are actively looking into whether donations to the Clinton Foundation were made in exchange for some type of political favors while Clinton was Secretary of State and whether tax-exempt funds were misused in any way. But this inquiry isn't entirely new. CNN reported back in 2016 that FBI agents in different field offices had opened preliminary inquiries into whether there had been any improper dealings with donors, but they didn't get very far. The inquiries fizzled out before Election Day, as we reported, but the Justice Department did agree that FBI agents could move forward if and when more evidence emerged down the line. Well, something has now changed, and there is an active probe, Anderson. And you're saying the investigation is being led out of the FBI field office in Little Rock, Arkansas. Do we know why there? It's one of the more curious parts of this story. I have to tell you, we know that there's a Clinton Foundation office in Little Rock, and we've reported that FBI agents in Arkansas were certainly part of that original group that I mentioned doing the inquiries back in 2016. But there were also probes in New York and elsewhere. So what we're digging into now is why Arkansas won out on this legal jump ball, so to speak. And what have Hillary Clinton or the Clinton Foundation said in response? Well, the Clinton camp pretty swiftly dismissed these allegations, calling this a politically motivated sham. And a spokesperson for the foundation told us that, look, time to time, the Clinton Foundation has been subjected to political motivated allegations. And time after time, these allegations have been proven false, he said. But we've also already seen today some legal experts raising potential statute of limitations challenges that would essentially serve as a bar to a successful prosecution in this type of criminal case against the foundation, which is certainly always a routine issue for the defense team to look at. But we're pretty far from that stage right now, Anderson. All right. Laura Jarrett, thanks very much. Coming up, the latest on another investigation, one that is Washington in its grips with no signs of slowing down. New reporting on the Russian investigation, the president, the attorney general, and his recusal, and update also from the White House next.